Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, going to be talking about traction or Felix subject. It's more about more historical nowadays rather than something that we usually do. Um, it's good to know a bit about what's uh, it's mainly about the history of it and the ways of doing it. Really. Uh, the outline is we're going to be speaking about the definition and principles of it. We'll look at the history of it, uh, purposes, advantages, uh, different appliances that they are needed for traction. What sort of traction we have, and uh, we look into skin traction, cellular traction, specific tractions that they've been available around, and also traction in children. So, attraction uh, is an application that pulls a force to to straight center part of the body in directions that we want them to be pulled. Uh, the principles of it is based on a fair rule of Newton that's about uh, uh, for every action there is a reaction that's equal and opposite to it, and this is the use of these forces uh, that helps uh, reducing the traction. For attraction, we have the traction force that pulls um, uh, uh, that's the pulling force that's uh, being applied to one part of the body, and we always have to have a counter traction force that uh, has to pull it in the opposite direction for the traction to work. Uh, <coughs> it's about it's about the vectors of the forces. So normally, if the, there are two forces going to different to different vectors, the resulting force um, can be a new force that goes into a different direction, and that's um, uh, the, the, uh, the line of the force that we want the, the limb to be pulled into that direction. <coughs> As an example, here if we put the forces A and B that they are 5 pounds each, the resulting force will be 10 pounds going um, in the direction in the, uh, uh, the direction shown in the picture. As we said, always counter traction must be there to, to be able to put traction on the limb. In terms of the history of it, uh, traction has been used about 3,000 years uh, uh, before Christ. That was the time of the Aztecs and ancient Egyptians. This is a traction that's been used in the uh, second century after Christ. This is a vegetable traction used by Greek people. Um, Aztecs were using um, branches of trees for traction. Uh, the first um, Person describing the tractions and talking about traction and extension was uh, Hippocrates that he described it in 250 BC. And um, after that, it was Guy de Choliac, that's the person that we call as the father of uh, traction in orthopedics. Uh, because of the Renaissance time, none of the information at the time of Hippocrates were available that well around. So, also a bit of um, Guy de Choliac's um, work wasn't available too much. but even after when he described the traction using the pulleys and the weights, uh, his job was used in the 16th and 17th century in Europe. <coughs> this is one of the first tractions that um, Hippocrates uh, described and designed. And uh, also these are the tractions that, that he described. And a, a person called Vidius collected all of these da data from Byzantine times and put it in the book. This is the opulent traction, and the other one shows the tractions on the whole body that we described uh, in reduction of the fractures. Uh, these are the same tractions that they, they use the, those uh, theories, and this is used in the 16th century in Europe, and as well as the UK and the States as well. Uh, those methods of using the, <coughs> the basics of Guy de Choliac have been used in the and um, uh, 17th century, they were using uh, gaiters and handkerchiefs for doing their reductions, but it was it needed to be appliance regularly. So this is one of the problems that they have. So they're always putting the traction in extension on a limb. Um, they also dissolved, described, modified. Um, uh, so physics modified the sole technique of attraction. He used them in the 1820s for the fractures that they had in the shaft of the femur. This was the latest, it was the last part, sort of um, uh, determination of uh, what they had. That was the Thomas Splint that was designed, and that was designed in the late uh, 18th, uh, 19th century. And um, uh, after that, that was Potts that came and uh, described a new theory. And what he was saying was that uh, most of the fractures they normally have to be reduced when the muscles around you are very relaxed, specifically in the thigh, because the musculatures are very, very strong. Uh, it's very important to react to muscles to be able to reduce them and let them heal. Um, so he said that they should be in a relaxed position, and for the shaft of the femur fracture, 
to describe that uh, both the knee and the hip should be flexed. It was very difficult at that stage to use uh, his theory because of the position of the leg and the pressure areas. The care of it would be very difficult and it was causing a lot of pain. So uh, that was difficult. So then um, Chester des uh, designed a double incline plane that made his theory usable and um, that's the time that we started to use his thought about reduction of fracture using, uh, uh, using uh, uh, his theory of the knee and the hip. Uh, it was in March 1849 that Hamilton, he, he published his fracture tables. What he wanted to do is he sent a table to different surgeons all around the country and he wanted to know what endpoint result of the fractures. The main reason that he wanted to do this was to use those data in courts because the surgeons were getting sued and then he wanted to show that this is the general result in the whole world but they don't do that well. But he used those information in publishing his tests with his fractures and dislocations. And uh, what he found, he looked at 136 fractures of all sorts and, and then uh, he listed about 83 femoral shaft fractures and only 9 of them had perfect result. And what he, what the, the point that he made was that you need to overcome the contracting muscles of the tie and that's when he suggested that you need to have more continuous and strong um, uh, traction on the fracture rather than having an isometric fracture. So he said, for reduction of traction, uh, you better use a splint and apply the splint to the limb and apply the traction to that splint that you apply. And he thought of applying the weight and to the limb itself rather than applying it uh, to, the, to the traction. Um, this is when uh, it was Nathan Smith that uh, described his first um, suspicion traction uh, that had a Big use in the first world war, specifically in compound wounds, that made that made it possible for them to be able to look after the wounds that didn't need to have it out of the traction or the splint, and that helped them reduce the fracture. And there was hogging splint that was that came at the same time and was used really, really widely in the world war. Looking at the some of the papers that you can see, it's something that they say that they all have to have and that's the necessity of. Uh, management of fractures at that stage. <coughs> uh, Crosby in the 1860s, he, he was the person that first described oppressive um, uh, splinting, uh, skin splinting, that was used at that stage, and then there was box extension, box scan, and used an oppressive um, uh, uh, skin traction, and used the fluids and the weights, that was in the 1880s, that he described his first traction, and this is the Part of the traction that we, I can say, we sort of use on the wheels as our skin tractions. Um, at the same time, there was a lot of talk about managing the fractures in children. At that stage, in the in the 18th, uh, in the 19th century, they were just letting them lie down on the side in the bed, and then that, that was the type of feeling, and then uh, the, the results were very bad. So, uh, Brian um, then. Uh, Thought of this method of traction, this is still used as the gallo traction in kids in a way. So, this is the first thought about the gallo traction that came in. Um, and then Hamilton Russell was an Australian surgeon in 1921. He, start, he described his um, traction that's sort of a uh, base on, on the previous tractions available as well as the suspension. So, keeping the knee in a bit of a flex position and sort of using the pulleys around it to reduce the fractures. It was about 25 years before the traction that um, Bronfin, the surgeon that was from Germany, uh, published his observation on a new kind of x-ray. And uh, he, they looked at the x-rays of um, uh, patients that had malignited fractures. And actually, David used in Porth as well as a sign of malpractice of surgeons. And he had a group of 115 patients from Pennsylvania Hospital. And the, the statement that he made was that the reduction was unsatisfactory in 100% of patients. So none of them had a satisfactory reduction. So again, the comment that made was that maybe at that stage, skin traction was not enough. And this is where skeletal traction was born, and this is where the use of skeletal traction came into use. Krishna uh, Steinman was the first person to use the pins. He used um, his um, pins and traction hooks to reduce the fractures. That was in 19. And then afterwards, there was piercing, sung, and attachment that used the pins and the method to reduce the fractures. 
and uh, then Krishna came and improved the traction flow, and um, that, that's the time that the Krishna wires as well were used for reduction of tractions. That was in the 1920s. Um, interestingly, that uh, became the mainstay and the main treatment of a lot of fractures during the wars, and specifically in the World War II as well. The whole focus was uh, about how to manage the traction. The traction was the only treatment that they used at that stage. Uh, they, uh, they, they paid, this paper has been published in the AMA uh, surgery in the 1950s and <coughs> was talking about 4,000 4, patients that were treated with traction at the time and talking about how good their results were. And interestingly, they were talking that they had 60% satisfactory results with the femoral fractures with, the, with these uh, tractions they used. So, this is an example of an upper limb traction that they used at that, at that stage. Uh, that was um, the treatment choice for Oculin. Um, they used the 1990 position for the traction inspection that's been in hospital for a long period of time. And they, um, that, that's when they were talking about pelvic fractures and we talked about femoral fractures. They used them uh, for the management. And as well as the fractures of the femur, they were using the femur to roughly hand infection for all of them. And uh, they thought this is a good way of managing compound fractures. Help them to look after the wounds as well as managing the fractures that they have. Um, after going through the history, the main main of traction is normally to uh, be able to get the length, the normal uh, leg to the normal length, and align the bones. Um, they try to immobilize the fractures with the traction. Uh, they try to get rid of the spasm in the muscles and as well as take the pressure off the nerves, specifically in the spine. And um, uh, they want to reduce the amount of skeletal deformity as well as the contracture of the muscles with the traction. Um, it's got some advantages. It uh, reduces the amount of pain. I would say this is the only advantage of um, uh, using tractions nowadays in managing the fracture. Um, it reduces the muscle spasm and it helps, as we said, to align uh, the fracture and uh, reduce the amount of deformity we have in the area. Um, the disadvantages that um, is one of the reasons that we don't use the traction and um, this as well as the need to keep that internal fixation is the, the cost the cost of staying in hospital. They normally had to stay in hospital for about six weeks minimum for the fractures. Uh, as well as staying in bed has got its own risks including having clubs, DVTs, keys, pressure sores as well as pneumonia and um, needs a very meticulous nursing care and nurses have to check the leg as well as be able to apply the tractions and also there's a chance of having high tractures. Um, in terms of putting the uh, traction, different appliances are used. One of them is like the bread bed in the frames. Normally the usual bed has got four uh, posts for the traction. Uh, there's the Bradford frame that's been used uh, for multiple injuries. Uh, this, this frame comes separate than the mattress. The mattress can be moved separately. Um, uh, you can uh, also move it up and down, you can move the pans forward, you can al also change the angle of the knee and also the hip if you need to use the traction specific position. Also we have the pulleys that they control the direction of the weight, in which direction the weight will go. And then based on how many pulleys we have, you can, you can change the amount of the force that you need and the amount of the force that you need to put. Uh, so <coughs> for example, if you use Four pulleys, uh, you may need to just have um, a, a, a weight of, um, if you have five, five pulleys, you just need a weight of eight kilos to produce 40 kilograms weight on the fracture for the reduction of the fractures. The way of meaning uh, less weight for the reduction of the fractures. You also need the weights, and the weights, um, they are, uh, the amount of weight that you need depends on multiple factors, like the weight of the appliance, also how, how much the weight of the limb suspended, also depending on the friction. Are, um, that's present in the whole system of traction. Uh, different type of tractions um, um, are described. We have the fixed tractions, and normally the traction is applied against a fixed point of counter pressure. The best example of it is a, hammer, is a Thomas splint, and the counter traction point is the issue to the velocity that they use it against. Uh, we also have sliding tractions, the sliding traction that use the point of the body. Uh, weight of a part of the body and the gravity to do the counter traction. You can um, use the limb and uh, lift the limb up or you can lift the whole body up to use it as a counter traction. Um, there are also mixed tractions as well and balanced tractions. 
that uh, they work on the, on the tension of the whole system or the fluids as the character. Um, also, they've been described by the type of traction that we have, uh, manual traction. This is most commonly used in the reduction of practice in theatres, like the Gauss that we do. Uh, this is of manual traction that we do day by day in, uh, in theatres. There are the skin tractions, but the traction is applied on a large area of skin. And um, there are two different main types. So that we have the adhesive type and the adhesive skin tracks. And the, non the adhesive type lets you put more weight to the limb, up to 6.5 kilograms. Not has non adhesive type is for people that they have atrophic skin and it doesn't let you put as much as this is 4.5 kilograms of weight that you can put to it. Also, we use the skeletal traction, it's either by it's putting, by putting a pin through or a wire to a bone. Uh, this is normally used in, in times that the skin traction does not work or in, in times that you need more, more force to go to a bone to reduce the fracture. Um, another type is attraction that's used by gravity. An example of it is a hanging cast that we use for human fractures that we can use commonly. And um, the first and the fourth one are the ones that we have to see people that use that quite often. Um, talking about the skin traction, normally the, the force that is put on a large area of the skin and that, that uh, distributes the load and shares the load and makes it more comfortable and efficient. Um, it normally transmits to the skin. Uh, goes to the bone, the fascia, and the fascia, and the septum, and that's how it boosts it. And they say it's better to put this attraction distally to where the fracture is to reduce the fracture. <coughs> uh, the indications that we have is temporary management of the necrofemoral fractures, and most likely, mostly proximal femoral shaft fractures, um, for pain relief of the patients. Um, it can be used for managing the femoral shaft fractures in children. Uh, indication of astabular fractures uh, that they treat inoperably. Um, also, after reducing the uh, dislocation of the hip, uh, tractions can be used, and sometimes from some minor uh, flexion between the lower hip and knee tractions can be used. There are some contraindications for it. Uh, abrasion and laceration of the skin is, is a contraindication to hematitis or gangrene or varicose veins, as well as mild shortening of the bony fragments that the skin traction may not work in this situation. And may need to have a stronger traction. Um, there are some complications with skin traction, uh, allergic reaction, um, uh, escort to the skin, also pressure areas of the skin is, is a reason, and also uh, if you apply, you can, if you um, put too much traction, it can cause pain or nerve force in the traction. Um, about the skeletal tractions, uh, different sort of pins are used. We've got the starting pin, that's the most common pin that we use. Uh, denim pin is, is, is similar to starting pin with the threads in the middle. It's good to use in calcareous bone in people that they are osteoporotic and also in calcium can be used for reduction. And also the Krishna wires, but they can be used in upper limb, but they are we can normally cut out and use them for the lower limb. Uh, they also have their own complications that can be um, interruption of infection to bones, and they can distract. Cause distraction of the fracture site if there's too much uh, force, also can damage the ligaments and it uses this. You need to be very careful about damaging the growth plate. Um, looking at the, we're going to look at some specific tractions that they are available around. There, there are spinal tractions that they've been used, um, uh, as well as upper limb ones and lower limb ones. Uh, in terms of spinal tractions, they get used for treating of unstable fractures. Uh, it pulls around uh, along the axis of the spine and um, it, uh, it presumes the alignment and uh, preserves the volume of the canal uh, in these sort of injuries. Uh, there are two main types of uh, tongs that they've been used. There's a gardener tongue that was um, easy to apply and they normally uh, place a uh, temporary to the external or to the max above the ears and uh, it's in line with the massive process. This is for the attraction of the spine. As well as a clutch free tongue that um, works similar to the garner tongue, it's just um, you need to incise the skin to be able to put the things in, and then uh, you need to drill the cord to be able to place it. Um, uh, the halo traction uh, is a type of traction that's been uh, used. Um, you put two pins on here, you put it on uh, spear and lateral to stick the orbital ridge, and there are two posterior pins that they are posterior secured to the skin right here. Uh, you can uh, try to put traction in the fencing, you can put more anterior for extension, you can put more posterior for flexion. Um, after this, uh, the halo vest, uh, because of the 
because neither the neither page has been uh, immobilized to use that say attraction that's been designed. Uh, it uses attraction and combines it with the body jacket, and I think all of us have seen them being used in spinal units uh, in a lot of patients. And the patient can be out of bed, they can walk around and, and use different sort of jackets for shifts and whatnot. So I've seen it mostly being used. There was also the head halter traction that's been used. You can use it in hospital, and you can also use it as an ass patient. The patients go there and then have the traction. Um, another type of uh, traction that's been used was um, the halo pelvic traction that's been used a while ago, and that was to immobilize the spine. And it's very slowly correct, so it uses the form, so you can see it's just been used for kids. Um, uh, going to the upper extremity traction, uh, this sort of skin traction has been used beforehand for reduction of upper extremity traction. The forearm skin traction was used before for reduction of clavicle fractures. Um, it was helpful if you, if you seen them, but it was causing ischemia of the limbs, so they had to be careful about them. The same thing about the double skin traction. The arm is giving a bit of abduction of about 30 degrees, and the elbow is flexed at 90. And you put two, uh, you have two traction force. One is goes to the humerus, and the other one is going to the forearm. And this was good for reduction of the GT fractures and the proximal humerus fractures. Again, you had risk of having ischemia and issues in the GT. Uh, also because of the forces of extraction. Uh, the other traction that's been used was dental extractions that were used for supracondylar fractures practice and transcondylar practice in kids. Uh, that was used when cord reduction was particularly the very traumatic at that stage. And um, then the forearm skin uh, traction, the, the, the forearm skin traction uh, for this and they fix the elbow at about 45 degrees to be able to use the traction. Um, one of the most common surgical tractions used for surgery in the world while was the olecranon and pin traction, but they were used for fractures. They described them being used for all sort of fractures of the humerus, including supracondylar dysphenia fractures, and um, and they they thought that they can be used to uh, make uh, angular flexion with the rotational flexions of the limb. And uh, the most common thing is to make sure when you apply it to avoid the NMA to cause any damage. It's interesting that. Um, they actually, in the papers that they were uh, written in the 50s, they, they all described about um, feeling the nerve and staying away from it in the uh, Another type is the lateral electron traction that they used for humerus fractures. Uh, they, they held down in the abduction, and the forearm was also in the skin fraction. And, um, and they were talking about not putting too much rope through it because it would distract the fracture site. Uh, also, the metacarpal pin traction that they've been used for reduction of the fractures and the pin was placed um, uh, where you can up with the base of the second and third metacarpal. And uh, that one of the issues that they had was the sickness that they had and increases. Um, the low extremity tractions uh, that they've been used, um, they were uh, they were commonly used in reduction of fractures of the lung bones. You can use it in the area of the lung bones in the leg. Uh, the main uh, thing is that they need a bed rest, so patients are in bed for about six weeks minimum with these sort of, uh, when you use these sort of tractions. And they were, uh, uh, the only indication nowadays is when you, when you cannot do surgery for any reason at all. And otherwise, there is no use for it. They can use both skin and skin and fractures at this stage. Uh, one of the common ones is the Thomas Splint, which I, even I think the downways are designed based on this. Um, uh, it's uh, used for femoral shaft fractures and uh, the contact action of these surgeries are used by ischemic sclerosis, and you need to make sure that work goes up um, near the ischemic to the five centimeters above it. And you need to measure the pressure of the and it should be uh, about 15 to 22 centimeters beyond the heel. Uh, the box traction is the most common one that I've ever used around. Normally, preoperatively for pain management, it can be used in patients with proximal or femoral fractures. You cannot use more than 10 pounds for these sort of skin fractions. Um, and you can you can use it for the optimal uh, reduction, so it's not going to be helpful. The other types of the upper femoral tractions that they've been used for acetabular fractures, and uh, you can use it in different uh, different there are different options that they are available for these sort of uh, fractures. And then um, you, you put a lateral traction uh, to the to the fracture site, and it can stretch the capsule ligamentum. That may reduce the acetabular fragment. Split <laughs> drosal traction is something that's been used widely beforehand. Um, it's some sort of box um, uh, 
traction that they had, and there is this thing, sort of a suspension type traction that's been used. And it can it get, it get, it can be used in fractures of just a human children, and you can modify um, the heat engineering as well in using this. The 1990 traction that uh, we might be used beforehand for the pelvic fractures as well as the subsurface proximal pelvic or femur fractures, and then um, they tried to match the fraction of the proximal fragment of the fracture. And one of the issues that they had with it was that it had some cause flexion contractures um, in the adults that they've been used. Um, a type of a skeletal uh, traction that's been used beforehand is a pair of constrictions which would be used in treatment of the infection of the tibia and also treating the fracture of the femur. Um, uh, it can also be used in treatment of psychiatric fractures of the femur in patients that they've been on uh, beforehand that we did not have the updated management. So, uh, you can use a denim pin and insert it to the upper end of the tibia for the fracture of the femur or mid tibia for the fracture of the femur of the tibia. Uh, also, some distal tibial tractions uh, have been used beforehand. You can use them in some sort of tibial plateau fractures. Uh, the pin is placed about 5 centimeters above the level of the ankle joint, and you need to avoid touching the stone and also make sure you avoid the perineal nerves as well as sending charge between the tibial tibia and go to the tibia. And um, you need to maintain the heat and the heat flexion for these sort of fractions. Uh, the other type is the calcaneal tra tra uh, traction, it can be used for fractures of tibia as well as the calcaneal fractures. It's about uh, 4 centimeters in the of the in the mouth that you put the pin and make sure you don't um, uh, spill the subtail joint and don't put the new vessel bundle applying these sort of fractions. Um, the, the only place that we put I've seen the new traction in children, so I thought to talk a bit about traction in children because they fall into three main groups. They, we keep the infants at 18 years and 18 months, and also then uh, we have the 18 months to 4 years old, and the children are about 4 years old. So, um, in kids that are infants <coughs> that are between 0 and 18 months, you can use traction for femoral shaft fractures. We always have to think about MAI about this group, age group, and the common tractions they use are the Bryce and Mandela tractions. And they don't recommend them being used after 18 months, and they say the, the weight limit is about 16 to 18 kilograms, some places. 12 kilograms as well, rather than 18, to use this traction. Uh, one of the points about the gala traction in kids is make sure that because they are associated with vascular problems, they can cause compartment syndrome as well as local and skin contracture. You need to be very careful. Uh, you need to apply very carefully. Um, you, you can use aggressive skin traction and you need to have an infection as well. And uh, make sure you don't bend too tight to not to cause the vascular uh, compromise that's associated. Uh, these are the two types of traction. The gallo traction, you normally put the heat at 90 degrees of flexion, and then you, the amount of the, the amount of uh, weight that you need should be enough to put the hand underneath the buttocks and nothing more than that is needed. And there's some sort of modified types of um, gallo traction. You can uh, uh, gradually change abduction of the legs from <coughs> using them. And uh, the other one is sort of the Bryant traction, that's the same as the gallo that uses also the box traction skin traction for rush. Um, the, in toddlers and small children, uh, the gallo traction we say is not appropriate. The Hamilton Russell is a good traction to be used. So the Thomas traction I've seen being used. Um, skeletal traction is not required. Just using the adhesive skin traction would be enough. Um, when I was reading, they were saying something like how much weight we need to use and how long. They were saying that it's one pound of weight or half a kilogram per year of your life. So if you've got a five year old, you need to have five kilograms. And it's one week per week of life. That's the traction view of the very time to use. Um, this is a traction that's been used in the kit that's been bigger. It's um, uh, the Hamilton Russell uh, traction that's been used. And in kids that they are 4 to 12 year old, um, uh, simple skin traction has to be left there for more than 6 weeks, so uh, it's not usable. And uh, then uh, it may not be skin traction, may not be powerful enough. So maybe using this uh, skeletal traction may be needed. And the same if you want to take a kid to put a pin in and then uh, use skeletal traction and use general anesthetic. So you can, based on what you have now, you can put it into the general and fix it. So there is no way of using traction for kids if they are about four years old. And again, the message is to make sure that you avoid the past to cause any growth of these children. Yeah. Okay.